Walking is supposed to clear the mind, so I start walking to work, even though it's South Sudan, even though it's forbidden. I've become confused as to why I've come to Sudan. I've flown across the world to help develop its lower third, but all I've done is sit in an air-conditioned trailer making spreadsheets behind a concrete wall topped with barbed wire that protects me from hundreds of dying people. This confusion has begun to feel more dangerous to me than bucking protocol, so I walk. And it's on an unpaved road that the cutest little boy in the whole wide world wanders up to me one morning, wearing a tattered oversized t-shirt that hangs past his knees. He hits me with a pearly white blowtorch of a smile and starts singing a little song of his own creation that goes, Kwai Joe, Kwai Joe. And this means foreigner or whitey, depending on who you ask. And the little boy holds out his hand for me to take, but here's the catch. The scalp of the cutest little boy on earth consists of oozing sores and is swarming with flies. His precious little head of curly hair is yellow from malnutrition. His parents have already probably started redistributing his share of the food to the healthier siblings who they've deemed more likely to live. The Center for Disease Control refers to Sudan as a living museum of infectious disease. And this little tyke obviously has more than his share. But that said, all he wants to do is hold my hand as he walks to school. And my white ass is only having an exotic walkabout in his country because it has pretensions towards making his life better. This is the most direct opportunity I've ever had to determine how full of shit I am as a human being. So I take his little hand and I watch him toddle alongside me while he sings his song. And when we pass his school, he turns and runs through the gate without saying goodbye. And then I keep going to the UNICEF compound, and I sit in my air-conditioned trailer, and I slather ethanol sanitizer all over my hands right up to the elbows. And if that's not a metaphor for aid work, then I don't know what is. You know, it's the kids that really are the worst part of this job. This is Stuart. I told Stuart about the little boy during our afternoon smoke break, and his response catches me a little bit off guard because he's a lawyer working in the child protection division of UNICEF. You know, you just can't win with him out here. There was one time I was up at a camp repatriating child soldiers, and this one kid, he couldn't have been a day over 12, he'd been in the camp as long as I had, and none of the local staff had got anything out of him. So finally, I sit him down. I buy him a soda, and I get him talking, and he lets slip a few details that lets me figure out where his village is. So we stick him on a plane, we fly him a few clicks to the south, and the guys on the other end make sure he's reunited, right? Heartwarming story. Stuart flashes his tricky grin, not unlike the one he wields on women. It is the grin that has earned him his nickname, Greasy Stew. Two months later, I'm walking through the camp again, right? And I see the little bugger just standing there staring at me, and I absolutely flip my gourd. He said he didn't have the, his family didn't have the money to feed another mouse, so he, uh, they put him out on the street and he kept walking. But the army wouldn't have him again because we told them not to. So I ask him, why the hell of all places you win? Why would you come back here? And he says to me, I like the soda. Oh, that's the last time I ever buy a kid a Coke, I'll tell you that much. Stuart rubs out his cigarette on the side of a tin trailer and drops it into an empty coffee can. So how do you keep doing this then? Oh, you know, I just keep looking on the bright side generally. See, there's a new German girl that just moved to town. She's quite fit, definitely worth a squirt, and her name is a good omen. All right, what's her name? <laughs> Van der Kock. And a naughty Oxford boy, naughty Oxford smile splatters all over Stu's face. So walking to work is not doing the trick, so I graduate to running. Stewart often mentions how often he likes to jog and he isn't ta when he isn't talking about anticipated sexual conquests or his love of snowboarding, so I ask him if I can join. I wait for him to change in our dining hall where I have a burlesque view of his bare legs descending the staircase, leading up to a pair of day-glow orange running shorts, slit up the side, right to the hip. Are you ready? Stuart adjusts a matching neon sweatband on his forehead. So do you want to uh, set the pace or do you just want to follow? No, no, I say. I'm going to try to stay in front of you for as long as I humanly can. We make it down the bend from the palace for about a kilometer without incident, and then Stuart inexplicably curves off the main road and cuts through a refugee village. And that's where the heckling begins. Hey, Kwaijo, Kwaijo. 
I tell myself the refugees are just surprised at seeing two white men running in the late afternoon heat for no better reason and with no enraged mob at their heels. But when the rocks begin whizzing past, it becomes clear that Stuart's dress has offended them. Oh, that one almost hit my head, he calls, grinning, and then he cuts back into a less inhabited street. Vegetable plots are there and struggling fruit trees. They're occupying the small fields to our right and to the left construction projects for the warlords and the nouveau reach merchants. A stream of sickly looking water is pouring out of one of these developments and it's pooling and parasite breeding stagnation in our path. A skinny Sudanese man in a red t-shirt and ragged pants pulls himself on his belly with terrible exertion out of the orchard he's been lying in and across the road until he can lower his face to the iridescent slick. Oh, man, Stuart says, don't drink that. The man's eyes flash ferocious at us, but he does not try to rise. So we run past him in a very, very wide berth. What the hell was that, I ask? Oh, it's either sick or drunk, I imagine. Well, should we do something? <laughs> Do what? Do you want to go back and talk him into going to the clinic with you? He didn't look like a particularly friendly cat to carry. And I do not want to carry the man to the clinic, so we round the bin, and he's gone from sight. And then there's more cat calls and shouts in Arabic and Dinka, and it moves us on at a fairly decent pace until we are able to return to the more inhabited sections of Juba and finally back to the palace. So yep, for going around again. Stuart jogs in place. He's turned pink from the exertion, and it's clashing with the orange, and I decide to call it with just the one lap. Back in my room, as I'm pulling off my clothes, I hear a child crying outside my window. It's not an uncommon sound, except for its persistence. It grows in intensity over the better part of half an hour. I climb up to the roof, and I lean over the ledge to see. Down below me, under the thunder of trucks and motorcycles and scooters, there's a toddler sitting by the road. The fingers of one hand are hooked around his lower lip and the other one's wrapped around his body. He's rolling his eyes up at every passerby and bleeding a cry directly at them, no longer just indiscriminately wasting his lungs. He sounds to me like a baby goat that's lost his mother and he is ignored with the same ease of any other crying animal. Some of the men and women living in the lean-tos down the road, they're out drawing their water for the evening and they notice me on top of the palace Yells and gesticulations are thrown my way, indecipherable, but certainly unfriendly, so I slink back. And the child is still at it when Stuart returns. You know, we should do something. He's 20 feet away. We just can't ignore him and let him get run over. Do what? Take him where? The mum could be just down the line at the well. Maybe none of the locals are doing anything because they know him. Do you really want them to watch two Kwaijos walk out of their compound, cross the street, and abduct a child? Do you really think that would end well for us? Come on, man. Come get a beer before dinner. The toddler's crying grows fainter when we reach the end of the block, and it's out of our ears altogether when we sit down with our two warm brews. I don't know how you keep at this, man. You're right. They're fucking kids, man. It's just like watching the horse that drove Dostoevsky insane. Stuart rolls his shoulders back and he eyes our Kenyan waitress's ass. You know, I'm not familiar with that. It's hard to watch, is what I'm saying. Oh, yeah, well, first of all, stop walking to work. Second, you just got to have your goals, right? I mean, I figure I'll be at this for at least two more years and then I'm done. Is that your limit? Well, you know, that's when I figure I'll have enough put away to pay off the second home. I'll have one in Sweden, one in the UK, one for skiing, one for the city, and then I can retire at 35, take a wife, maybe open a sporting goods store. You know, get back to snowboarding. And I think about this and I realize that I do not know what my limit is, but I suspect I may have already passed it quite some time ago. The child is gone when we return. And I am grateful. Thank you.